So what I have for you today is I have three stories, three stories that examine the way we relate to the landscape. And before I start, it's important for you to know that each one of these stories is based on real historical events and real historical characters. This first story, you know, I have sometimes thought that there are people who live off the land and then there are people who just seem to be of the land. And this is a story about people of the land. And it comes to us from the Athabascans of the Upper Kuskokwim. It was recorded by Ray Collins. Story goes like this. There were once two sisters. Those sisters married two men, hunters, and the sisters, their husbands, and several other hunters had a camp in the foothills of Denali. Now one day the men went out hunting, leaving the women behind in camp. And the men had not gone far when all of a sudden the women heard there were shouts and cries. It was clear that the men were being attacked, but by whom they weren't sure, because there were some skirmishes that were going on between different groups of Athabascans. Well, the women were frightened. They felt as though there was no way their husbands and the other hunters had survived. And so they fled camp. They ran across the landscape, and when at last they were exhausted and they stopped, they assessed the situation. And they thought, they can't go back to camp. Surely whoever did the ambushing has gone to camp, and they did not want to be captured. All they had were the clothes on their back, a knife, and one of the women had thought to grab a little piece of burning punk wood, and that was the way that they could light fire. So these two women, the sisters, they began to travel across the landscape. And at last, hunger began to gnaw at their stomachs. Soon it felt as though it was just gnawing on their bones. Now, it was spring, so the days were getting longer, the light was getting stronger, and the snow was beginning to disappear. And these women found themselves standing on the edge of a ground squirrel colony, because this was the time where the ground squirrels were waking up and popping out of their holes. So they watched these squirrels pop up, but how to catch them? Well, then one of the sisters found some eagle feathers that were lying on the tundra. She picked them up, she ripped the barbs off, so she just had a long feather shaft. And then she used that feather shaft to make a snare. And they placed that snare in front of one of those ground squirrel holes and they waited and they watched. And the little ground squirrel head popped out a little bit more. A little bit more, the sisters, come on, come on, come on. Suddenly there was this whack, and they caught that ground squirrel, and they cooked it, and it was delicious. Well, they lived off ground squirrels all summer, and as other plants ripened, they brought those into their diet, and at last, it was blueberry season. But of course, when it's blueberry season, that means that now there was darkness, there was a chill at night, the northern lights would dance in the sky, and the tundra was changing colors orange and red and yellow. The women realized that they could not stay where they were because the ground squirrels would soon be disappearing for the season. So they began to follow the swift fork of the Kuskokwim down to the lowlands. They were eating berries as they went along, and at last they came to a large lake. And at the, end of one of the, at the end of the lake, there was an outlet stream. And they found that that outlet stream was choked with whitefish. The whitefish were leaving the lake. So those two sisters somehow made a fish weir. And they began to catch that whitefish. And for the first time in a very long time, they had plenty to eat. They caught so many fish, they were able to dry some of the fish, and they were able to dig down into the ground where the ground was frozen and place the fish there, and there the fish would freeze and keep. And the sisters realized that this is where we will spend the winter. So they began to make a home. Now, somehow, they dug a hole into the earth. It was maybe four feet deep, large, squarish, and then they cut poles, and with those poles, they made a structure. And then they went to the birch trees and they cut away that birch bark, peeling it off the trees. And they took those sheets of birch bark and leaned it against the poles. And then against that birch bark, they piled sod and dirt. 
So when they were done, they ended up with this mound that one of their chiefs would later describe as, it looked like a beaver house. They made a little hole in the top, and that is where the smoke escaped. And that is where the two sisters settled down to spend the winter. Well, they were one day sitting in their house when they suddenly heard noises outside. And initially, they were frightened. Were these the ambushers who had found them at last? At last, they peeked out. And what they saw was their brother. Their brother had been searching for them ever since they had not returned from their hunting camp in the foothills of Denali. They showed the brother the fish, and the brother said, this is a good place to spend the winter. So he moved there, as did some others, and soon they had a small village. Now, the Athabascan word for whitefish is talaya. We know this place these days as Talida. So that is how the community of Talida, which is just to the west of the park, came into being, according to this very old story. Now, may I see a show of hands of those of you who, if you found yourself out on the tundra with just the clothes on your back, a knife, and a way to make fire, you would survive. Exactly. When I read that story, it was like, wow, gosh, impressive. So from that sort of relationship to the landscape, we're going to move to um, something in more modern times. It, of course, people of, Atha, uh, people of European background started moving into the area when they came here looking for gold. And for those of you who were here for Eric's presentation, you heard about the Klondike gold, or the, the Kantishna gold rush that happened down at what's now the end of the Park Road, uh, 1904 to 1906. There was a huge rush of people to that area, maybe as many as 2,000 people. And then, of course, that petered out and people moved on, but there was sort of a handful of people who stayed behind. And there was one person in particular who stayed behind who became a very colorful character here in Denali. She was a woman by the name of Fanny Quigley. Now, Fanny, she came here from Wahoo, Nebraska. That's where she was born in a small bohemian community. They say that she spoke Czechoslovakian first, learned English later, but she came up here to the North Country and, and really lived here until her death, 1944. Um, a great friend of the park, a really colorful person. And, and to tell you a little bit about, well, actually, I think to learn about Fanny's life, we should just ask Fanny. What do you think? Yeah. Well, so we're going to tap into, uh, to bring Fanny back today, tap into some technology. It's very old technology. It's called our imaginations. <laughs> and let me introduce you to Fanny quickly. Hello! My name is Fanny. Do you know me? <laughs> well, then you have not been in Alaska for very long, because everyone knows who I am. I tell you, I get mail. It is addressed Fanny Quigley, Interior Alaska, and it comes to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now, if you would have told me when I was a little girl in Wahoo, Nebraska, that I would spend most of my life living in the wilds of Alaska, I would have, I would have called you a liar. But that has been true. I, I don't know how it happened, but it's been a good life. It's been hard work, but it's been good. Now, I imagine that most of you are here because of the park, right? All right. Well, I was here before there was a park. I came here for gold. Now, it was, it was 04, when Joe and Jack Horn, they went and registered their claims in Fairbanks. And suddenly, everybody was talking about the Kantishna, the Kantishna, the Kantishna, the Kantishna. Now, I was at China at the time. And I knew enough. I pulled up my tent stakes. I took my sign that said, Meals for Sale. And I headed south for the Alaska Range because I knew, see, I had come up for the Klondike. And I knew if you got up here late, you would not get a claim, which meant you would not get gold out of the ground. But I also learned, if you could not get gold out of the ground, 
You could get gold out of the pockets of hungry miners by filling their bellies. Right, so I go to the cantina. That is when I met Joe. I move in with Joe. Everybody thinks we are married. I did not set them straight. <laughs> but do not worry for my eternal soul, because we did eventually get married. But Joe and I, we were partners, because we both wanted to find the mother load. So Joe, he was a very good prospector. I learned how to prospect, but mostly I kept the fires burning at home. Now, are any of you prospectors? Or done some prospecting? OK, yes, well then you know. Prospecting is like trying to find a haystack of needles, right? No. Needle? Need well, anyway, you look here, you look there, you take some dirt, you put it in a pan, you swish it around. If you are lucky, you have color. But that doesn't happen very often, does it? No. If you have color, though, you stake a claim. Now, I do not know how many claims Joe and I placed in Kentishna. It was a lot. But we found gold on the surface. We also did the hard rock mining. You know what that is? No, you don't. It is when you put a hole in the ground and you take out the ore. So in the end, I mean, we had gold, we had lead, we had silver. We did OK. We had enough. And because we had enough, it was always a pleasure. When people would come through the country, we would bring them over. We would show them hospitality. You know, give them a meal, give them a nice place to stay. That is where I met Mr. Sheldon. Yeah, it was, it was uh, Ot 7. Harry Carstens brings Charles Sheldon by. Says they are going to spend the winter at the Toklat. Now, we thought they would make fine neighbors. So we had them in, we gave them a lovely dinner, we gave them a place to sleep, and then they sent on their way. And do you know, do you know it was Mr. Sheldon who taught me how to hunt? No, you see, I had come down to the cantation, I had killed nothing. And my husband, Joe, tries to teach me how to hunt. Now, ladies, has your husband ever tried to teach you something? Exactly, Joe, oh, he's driving me crazy. So in the winter months, we go over to the Toklat, and we are visiting Charles Sheldon and Harry Carson. We all decide to go hunting. Now, Charles Sheldon, he normally liked to hunt alone. But as we go out, Harry and Joe, they go somewhere over here. Mr. Carson and I, we go hunting together. We climb up into the mountains. We are climbing higher, higher, it, it is winter. And that Mr. Sheldon, he is like, a mountain goat, but I kept up. So we get up, we find this band of dull sheep. Mr. Sheldon, he shows me how to hold my gun. He shows me how to aim. He shows me how to ease the trigger. And then it's my turn. And when I shot, my gun misfired twice. And when I finally did get a shot off, I missed. The dull sheep ran over the hillside. I was so embarrassed, but I learned a lot. And in time, I became a crack shot. In fact, there was this time with Joe. It was in the fall. Game was hard to find. So Joe and I, we are hunting together. And we are finding nothing. We are stepping on one another. And finally, I say, Joe, oh, you go over here, and I am going to go over here. So I go over here. And in one day, I get two caribou and a black bear. I skin them out, I bring them home, everything is all washed up, and then along comes Joe with nothing. So I went into the house, I got my skirt, I came out, I said, here, wear this. <laughs> From now on, you are doing the housework and I am going to wear the pants of the family. But you know, I had to become a crack shot because if I did not kill it, I had to pick it, I had to grow it, or I had to haul it in, and all of that was hard work. One year, one year, I picked 1,200 pounds of blueberries. 1,200 pounds. And to get firewood, I had to mush my dogs 20 miles, I cut down the trees, I haul them back, then I have to saw them to length, I have to split them so they will fit in the stove, and Joe and I, we went through four or five cords of wood a year. 
That was hard work. And then my garden. Now, you had to try to have a garden, but in Kantishna, the soil was crap. So I had to haul in soil. We lived on a hill. I had to make terraces. And once I had those terraces, oh, well, then I grew potatoes and cabbage and lettuce and turnips and rutabaga and rhubarb. And so when people would come to our house, I would lay a table spread and they would look, it would be caribou steaks, caribou, I shot myself. It would be vegetables, vegetables I grew in my garden by myself. It would be blueberry juice from blueberries I had picked myself. And if I liked them, at the end, they would get a nice slice of rhubarb pie. And they would say, Fanny, your crust, your crust is so flaky. What is the secret? I think some of you know the secret to a flaky crust, bear fat. It'll work every time. Well, when they were done eating, their eyes would just pop. Oh, but it was hard work. You know, in all of the time I lived in Alaska, I only went outside once. And when I went outside, the world was different. Automobiles. Huh. I came home early because this was my home. I did not fit in there. And as I know, some of you know, when you fit in here, you do not fit in outside. <laughs> I've got to say, I came here looking for gold, but what I found was a life. So Fanny Quigley, she wrote in a letter to Charles Sheldon that she had picked 1,200 pounds of blueberries. All right, now I know that blueberry picking here is almost like a professional sport. And there are some pretty serious pickers. Is there anyone who has ever approached anywhere near? I don't know how many gallons that is, but I mean, that's how we normally measure it. It's like if you, somebody who gets five gallons, it's like, whoa. And I confess that I was one of those finger pickers for a long time until somebody showed me those combs that you could use with the blueberry. My volume went way, way up. But I, was, I happened to be in Atlanta once for some training, and there was a woman, she knew I had come from Alaska, and she, she looked at me and she goes, so where you live, what do you do for fun? And I said, I said, well, you know, we go hiking, we go backpacking, um, blueberry picking. And she went, oh, berry picking? <laughs> so it definitely is an acquired activity once you get up here. But I've got to say that that first blueberry of the season, you know, when you're walking across the tundra and you see that blueberry bush and you look down and you're like, wow, that's good and blue. And you reach over and it's, it's not hard anymore, it's kind of nice and soft and you pick it and you put it on your tongue and you bite into it and there's that burst of juice and the juice, that tanginess that goes along the edge of your tongue, that is something that I would savor. Which brings me to my last story. So we've had a landscape where it's not civilization, it's not wilderness, it simply is. We have another exploration of where we've brought in, we have the sense of there's civilization here and there's gold to be found here and let's try to carve out a little bit of civilization here. And then we've got this landscape where we can walk across the tundra and savor that first blueberry of the year and not associate it with the fact that we have to now pick 1,200 pounds. And so how did that come to be? And that brings me to my story of two men. Now we are here on a momentous occasion. A hundred years ago, this very day, this park was signed into being. What I would like to do is take you back 109 years ago, this very day. Now 109 years ago, this very day, there was a blizzard raging on the Toklat. Help me with this blizzard. 
serious, it's a serious blizzard. Come on, make it a big one. <laughs> and in this little cabin, there on the Toklat, we have Charles Sheldon, Harry Karstens, and Joe and Fanny Quigley. Joe and Fanny Quigley came over to visit and also do some hunting. So now as this blizzard rages around this cabin, Charles Sheldon leaves the cabin twice. He leaves the cabin, he goes up river, he climbs up into the mountains, and what he is looking for is a band of doll sheep that he's seen in the area a few days before. And why is he looking for these sheep? Because he wants to record their behavior. He wants to see how these sheep are acting in these extreme weather conditions. But the visibility is too bad. So he turns around, he's making his way back to the cabin. And on his way back to the cabin, he goes through a little bit of woods. And as he's traveling through the woods, he sees these chickadees. And these chickadees are just kind of flitting around in these branches. And he notes that they seem oblivious to the extreme wind and the blowing snow. That is just one of the innumerable naturalist notes Charles Sheldon is going to take about this landscape during his time here. Well, eventually the weather clears, the blizzard lasts several days, and when it's done, the sled dogs need meat. So Charles Sheldon, who'd like to hunt alone, puts on his snowshoes, he goes up over a draw, drops down into the next river valley, which is the East Fork. He shoots two doll sheep, guts them, leaves them, and Harry Karstens will later come and pick them up by dog sled. And meanwhile, Harry and Joe Quigley, they go hunting someplace else. They also get some doll sheep. And as they're coming back, they notice there in the snow, there is a wolf track. And Charles Sheldon notes that it is the first sign of wolf that they have seen in their time in the Toklat. Well, after a couple of days, Joe and family go home, leaving Harry Karstens and Charles Sheldon there at the cabin to fall into their usual rhythm. Now, to compare these two men, they, they are almost like the wilderness version of the odd couple. <laughs> You've got Charles Sheldon, Yale-educated, born into affluence, but due to circumstances, forced to find his own way, which he does with great success, so much so he can retire in his 30s, yes, <laughs> and dedicate his life to conservation. And then you've got Harry Karstens, who was born in Chicago, limited formal education, who comes up here to the North Country and earns a PhD and then some in how to survive and thrive in the North. And the way these two men come together is purely practical, because Charles Sheldon needed a guide and Harry Karstens needed a job. But when the two are together, it is apparent that there is something special between them because when it comes to living in a wild place, these two men are simpatico. Charles Sheldon, he heads off. He is collecting specimens for the biological survey, but mostly what he is doing is observing. He's probably the first person who's come into this landscape just to watch, just to see how the mammals move around, how they interact with one another. And while he's at it, he's noting things about tracks, things about plants. Harry Karstens helps with the specimens, but also just helps with things at camp. And the two men have such a rhythm together that no doubt they had many rich conversations. And we don't know when it happened. We don't know whose idea it was first, but somehow in their time together there on the Toklat, they talked about what was happening. They talked about how Fairbanks was growing and how Men were coming down, the market hunters, and taking the doll sheep and the caribou, taking them up to Fairbanks to sell that meat. They talked about the railroad that was going to be coming through soon, and the two of them realized that this rich area, rich in wildlife, was not going to last. So somehow, in their time together, that idea was born that this should be a national park. Well, spring rolled around, and they realized that their time on the Toklat was growing short. So they started to pack up their specimens, and Harry Karstens began to pack them over to Glacier City. And from Glacier City, he was going to take them by boat up to Fairbanks. And Charles Sheldon enjoyed a few last days at the cabin. And it was during that time alone, he wrote about how he watched this landscape shake off winter. 
He watched how the animals began to move around. He described how the world, how the, the air was just full of bird songs that he described as songs of love. And he recorded the first flowers that he saw blooming. And then it was on June 11th, Charles Sheldon put his saddle on his horse, which he had named Toklat, and he began to move down the river. Now, at this place on the Toklat, it is a broad braided river. And Charles Sheldon, he's traveling down the river, he's traveling north. And there is a point where the Toklat narrows and goes into a canyon. And there, Charles Sheldon pauses and he turns and he looks upstream for the last time. He sees Mount Sheldon, he sees Cabin Peak, he sees Bear Draw. In the distance, he sees the Alaska Range moving in and out of the mists. And then he turns and enters that canyon. Now his plan was to go by himself overland to Ninana. And what he must have felt as he went across that landscape, feeling that sadness for this leaving behind this land that he had come to love, but feeling such hope at what he could do to preserve this landscape for the future. So he got to Ninana, he got up to Fairbanks, eventually he got home, and we all know that eventually he was successful in working with others and creating this national park. And a hundred years ago, this very day, imagine Woodrow Wilson taking that pen, signing the park into existence, and handing that pen over to Charles Sheldon. But at this point, this park, you might as well have just taken that pen, drawn a line on a map, because that is all it was. That imaginary line, that imaginary boundary. Animals certainly didn't respect it. And it's something that it requires that you be knowledgeable and that you care, that when you step over that park boundary, you understand that you have stepped into something special. And at that point in time in Alaska, there were few people who knew about this park, and there were even fewer people who cared. Enter Harry Karstens. Now, none of us are perfect, but we can hope to be the perfect person at the right time and place. And that was Harry Karstens when he became our first superintendent, 1921. When you read about his accomplishments, it is like he is superhuman. First things first, patrol the park in the winter months by dog sled, keep an eye on those poachers, take those market hunters to task. Done. Go into the wilderness, carve out a place where we can have park headquarters, build the buildings yourself. Done. Communicate with people around the state about this park and what it means and why it's here. Done. Communicate with Washington, D.C. Done. Now, some of those things Harry enjoyed more than others. But it was all hard work. But when he was done, Harry Karstens was successful in waking up the people to the idea of what they had here, this national park. So many years ago, the cosmic tumblers brought together two men. Their time in one another's company was limited, but that vision that common vision that they came away with was something that united them for the rest of their lives. And it is that common vision that allows us today to go out into this landscape and imagine what it might be like if we had to survive with just a knife and a little piece of burning punkwood. It's something that allows us to wander through this landscape and imagine what it might have been like to do prospecting, trying to find gold. It's something that still allows us to walk on this landscape and marvel at the wildlife and savor that first blueberry of the season. It is that vision that brings us all here today and inspires us as we turn and we look forward to the next 100 years. Happy birthday, Denali. Thank you.